launches and satellites and light sails. Oh, oh my. my. Oh my god, that it actually worked. worked. <laughs> 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 wow! Uh, let's start the show! And welcome to tomorrow, episode 8.17. <laughs> For Saturday, June 5th, 2015, my name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me, as always, the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham will be your host for this episode. Now, before we get started, a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific of this episode happen. <laughs> I'm just going to keep rolling right over it. Yep. These are people who have contributed at least $10 to this specific episode. We are a crowdfunded show. Every single dollar helps, and these are the premier members. They contribute basically the most. So a huge thank you to all of our premier members. For more information on how to contribute, you can head over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. We were obviously off for two weeks. I'm like, I love that. Right, yeah, exactly. I know. And somebody offered, or not offered, but they wanted to hang out after the show, and I said that they could come and be a live audience member. And I said, but this is going to be a rough one. You may not want to <laughs> yeah. see this one. That goes to all of you watching live and on demand, although we have a really active chat room, so yeah, welcome no, to everyone awesome. from the Thanks, chat room. Guys. Yeah, it's really great. All right, let's go ahead and get started with some launch coverage that we missed from a couple weeks ago. This goes all the way back to May 20th, Ooh. 2015. It's an Atlas V. It's the launch of the X-37B. Check it out. Two, one, zero. We have RD-180 ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of the United Launch Alliance SPC-5 payload with the Atlas V launch vehicle for the United States Air Force. So liftoff happened at 1505 coordinated universal time. That was the orbital test vehicle mission number four, Ativ four, I guess. That was as as the mission name kind of implies. That is the fourth X-37B space plane. Those are those kind of like miniature unmanned space shuttles that the Air Force has been sending up. The neat thing about those is that you basically get a pickup truck size it's like two meters long by one and a half meters wide worth of cargo that you can send up to space for over a year have it hang out in space and then come back and recover it at a later later time in addition to launching the x-37b for its super secretive air force mission they also sent a collection of cubesats known as ultrasat or the unique lightweight technology and research auxiliary satellite uh, and some of these uh, little CubeSats, we've got, uh, you know, I'm going to ignore their name. I'm not going to talk about all of them because there are like 10 of them. But a couple interesting ones. One, they're testing a web server in space, like a little Apache web server. That's kind of cool. Uh, so not entirely sure why you need a web server in space. The latency would be high, but I'm sure there's some <laughs> sort of cool application. Now, but if maybe, you're in space, it's less, right? I, I, wonder, if you, I wonder if it's been hacked yet. Uh, the, oh. the, second thing, <laughs> the second thing is they're testing miniature plasma pulse thrusters, so little, little yeah, plasma cool. thrusters. Uh, and they've got some orbital debris studies going on up there. And then, of course, we've also got the Planetary Society's, I almost said Planetary Resources, the Me Planetary too. Society's light sail, which is another propulsion method. Uh, but this uses the giant fusion reactor in the sky, our sun, in order to help propel the light sail forward. And so I'm going to use that as my segue. Boom, Carrie Ann. Tell us a little I, bit I about love that. It. That was a really good Bill Nye impression, too, by the Boom. way. What, which one? No, the fusion reactor in the sky. A fusion reactor in the sky. <laughs> so, will uh, change the world. <laughs> so, the Planetary Society, not Planetary Resources, love you, love you anyway. With Bill Nye, the planetary guy. <laughs> yes. Uh, got a light sail up into space. Thank you, Atlas. Uh, and it, everything. Why was, you're welcome, Light Sail. I know. So everything was going great, uh, and then we had a little bit of an issue, but we got contact back at Earth. This is really cool footage. Not footage. I'm sorry. This is really cool. <laughs> that is really cool. Live footage of the Light Sail. Oh, I wish you could see my face right now. Not footage, Carrie Ann. Bad. Anyhow, so that happened. We got the solar array deploy, and that was very cool. And then next thing you know, we lost contact again, which is so we've. Lost contact of, with it twice now. Yeah, this is the second time, again, shortly after solar panel deploy. Uh, we believe that the batteries are actually in some sort of safe mode. And over the next couple of weeks, the cell, the light sail is going to actually reach an orbit where they're going to get continual light the entire time in orbit. 
it. So they're hoping that the batteries are going to get recharged. And once the batteries are up to charge, then uh, the light sail will make contact again. Uh, contact with light sail it will be reestablished is what I'm trying to say. Can't they just use the giant fusion reactor in the sky to help power the vehicle? Yeah, too? right now they're not at that orbit. They're they're getting oh, in they're a, too low. Yeah, they're getting an eclipse like every 2100 uh. seconds or something silly like that. So it's sort of like ah, 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 and that's about it. Uh, so <laughs> That was my best kitty you impression, made, by the you way. Made me snort. Yeah, Dennis oh, laughing too. Man. Anyhow, but the point there is, uh, you, you understand. So it's 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 not getting enough light uh, in a in a in a serious manner, I suppose, at this point. So that's what we're hoping for. But we believe we got solar deploy or solar array deploy. Did they get it back? Somebody in the chat room saying that they got it back already. No, well, we so I think I, because we I don't think we got it back yet. Yeah. All right, because we had it. Right, it was broken. We had it. We got it back, and then we lost, lost it, again. it again. Yeah. So. Anyhow, hopefully, yeah, perfect impression. See, thank you. There you go. All right. All right, let's <laughs> send it on over to Space Mike with some additional space news. Space Mike? Yeah, I wanted to talk about how SpaceX, the CRS number six, or Commercial Resupply Services number six, Dragon Capsule, returned to Earth. And it brought back with it some really cool stuff. Um, Dragon Capsule is the only vehicle that we, that we have so far that can return down mass back to Earth. And what it returned was uh, some science experiments from a space aging study. Uh, these were uh, lots of different experiments, and this, this particular study has been going on for several years now, and multiple nations are involved with this and so they brought back some of those very sensitive samples back to earth as well as samples for another study uh, for the osteo 4 experiment which is checking out oscillites which are the most common cell in 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 your bone marrow and to see how those sort of changes uh, occur um, with different uh, uh, species that they've been testing for the, for these experiments that have applications to humans and so uh, that was really cool but probably the coolest thing for me was that they returned the spin SpinSat experiment. The SpinSat experiment is a spherical um, miniature satellite that had lots of thrusters that are a unique test of an electric solid propulsion thruster. And what that means is that with these solid propelled thrusters, it's essentially just a regular solid rocket motor, a miniature one that is powered by electricity. The electricity is what is able to ignite the solid fuel to get short burns. And as soon as there's no electricity flowing through these thrusters, thrusters, then it, they shut off. And what that allows them to do is to have the potential to have unlimited starts and restarts. And for this sort of thruster, they would only use it for um, reaction control surfaces or uh, maneuverability. They, so far, the company that makes them, Solid State Propulsion, hasn't come up with any sort of plans to upscale that and have larger electrically powered solid rocket motors. But it would be a cool idea. And at least in the meantime, for these thrusters, it was a really cool idea. And supposedly, the test was some completely successful. They released it from the Canada arm, returned it back into the Kibo module, loaded it into the Dragon capsule, and returned it to Earth. So that's very cool, and uh, I'm very happy about the, the success of that. So anyway, I'm going to turn it back to Ben, who has uh, some updates on some satellites that were recently launched. Actually, I've actually got some breaking news. Roll the breaking news <laughs> intro, Dutta. Thanks, Dutta. So this just in. Apparently, actually, uh, your last story, <laughs> we've been reading. Yeah. <laughs> food, food, breaking news. <laughs> Important be, stuff. There you go. Um, uh, <laughs> listening to the chat room, there is a, a, the, we have restored com communication with LightSail as of like an hour or two ago. So awesome. We, awesome. So we're just not, uh, we're not. We're not up to date as we should Somebody be. Somebody took a nap. Sorry. So we, yeah, there you go. So all right, moving. So it sounds like we have communication yes. with light sail again. So we had it, we lost it. No, we lost it, we had it, we lost it, and now we have it again. Yay! As of so, uh, any predictions as to whether we'll keep it? <laughs> <laughs> Ho hopefully so. It's, it's so for those who don't know, light sail is really cool because it uses the giant fusion reactor in the sky Much better, to propel see? itself. Right, and it just uses the sun. It's just a huge, gigantic sail, essentially. Mm -hmm. That it, I mean, its name is fairly self-explanatory. That uses light to propel itself. Yeah. But this is important because it's on a CubeSat, mm -hmm. and traditionally, CubeSats are relegated to low Earth orbit or lower uh, because they don't really have very advanced propulsion systems on them because they're tiny. Tiny. They're tiny. So with a light sail type system, maybe we could get a CubeSat to Mars, to Jupiter, Ooh. to somewhere else. If we can get it up high enough, extend the 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 
the sail. Mm -hmm. I was like, photovoltaic, nope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Extend the sail and then let it just kind of let the sun, the giant fusion reactor in the sky, push it out to where it needs to go. I think that would be, be kind of cool. cool. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, and I completely killed uh, Mike's segue. Yeah, it was, was like, a good segue. It was a good segue. And I'm like, sorry. no. No, so my, my segue should have been to, there's an Ariane 5 launch uh, with some DirecTV satellites. Here you go. Whoosh, this happened May 28th, 2116 coordinated universal time. Aboard, there are two communication satellites. I almost said commsats. I'm not supposed to do that. Two communication satellites. We have DirecTV 15 and Sky Mexico 1. Now, I, so Sky Mexico 1 is a fairly standard communication satellite. But the thing with DirecTV 15 mm -hmm. is it's a sister with DirecTV 14, and that it allows extra uplink channels essentially, which will enable 4K distribution to the United States. So what this, huh. what they're trying to do with DirecTV 14 and 15 is get DirecTV up to 4K live broadcasting standards. Nice. Which I find a little bit ironic because while this was launched by Ariane Space, so clearly not a NASA launch or anything here in the US, they still broadcast NASA TV in the lowest possible quality they can, this itty bitty standard definition window, even though NASA makes available to them for free in high definition. So here's the thing, it's, it's not broken. Why are you going to try to it? It's broken. I want them. If DirecTV is already <laughs> moving to 4K, hear my plea, DirecTV. Be more awesome than your competitors and start broadcasting NASA TV just in HD, not in 4K. No, 4K would be good. Be Although that would be amazing. That'd be amazing, but I don't think NASA provides it in 4K. They give it to you for free, for free broadcast in HD. Please, please, DirecTV. <laughs> Hashtag DirecTV NASA HD. Hashtag DirecTV. There you go. All, all of our citizens of tomorrow. There you go. So uh, that's what that's what they just launched. The DirecTV and then um, uh, Mexico Sat, uh, Sky Mexico One uh, satellites up for ComSat kind of stuff, enabling 4K. So someday we can watch NASA in high def. All right, there you go. Other other launches. Carry on. Other launches. There was a Soyuz. Sil uh, <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> yep. Soyuz launched a military satellite. Thanks for that footage. Yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, this is a cobalt-type reconnaissance satellite uh, that launched Friday aboard a Soyuz rocket. It was a... <laughs> there you go. There yes, you go. There's yes, the footage. Yes, yes. There's the footage that Russia released. Thanks, guys. Right? That's great. That's fantastic. Lifted off from the Plastic Cosmodrome in northern Russia. It was 1524 GMT, or UTC, 1124 AM EDT. This is according to, I kid you not, a statement... Released by the Russian Military of Defense. Did you this just use GMT on this yeah, show? Yeah, well, because I, I copied and pasted it. I apologize. Uh, the new satellite is Cosmos 2505. I know you can just yell at me for that later. The, the payload sent to orbit was likely a Cobalt M Earth imaging satellite, which carries a high-resolution cam optical camera able to spy on things. Uh, and actually, the one thing I thought was kind of interesting, though, they still use the canisters of film. So they, they shoot a whole bunch of stuff and then have to shoot the canisters down. Do they really? Yeah, that's according to, yeah. It is, it? It is fairly <laughs> secure. I mean, I mean if you're doing it, it on is, film. It is a physical, right? As long as yeah. you just release the canister over Russia, it's kind of hard for another agency to hack that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Although, and, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the satellite will likely be the last in Russia's Cobalt series, according to RussianSpaceWeb.com. No, I'm not making that up. So there you go. <laughs> we they run, launched a military satellite. Speaking of military satellites, <laughs> Space Mike, what's going on with uh, some national launchy stuff? <laughs> SpaceX has finally been certified to launch national security payloads Huzzah! by the United States Air Force. Oh, it's awesome. After two years of really hard work and cooperation between SpaceX and the United States Air Force, they've finally been certified to compete in national security payloads. And what that means is United Launch Alliance is still their main provider, and they're going to allow SpaceX to compete in future competitions. The first one that they'll be able to compete for will be 
launching the GPS third generation satellites. As of right now, there's nine of these satellites built, and so SpaceX and United Launch Alliance are going to be able to compete for that. That competition was supposed to have started this month. However, the Senate has gotten involved and has made some new um, requirements for the GPS-3 program because it's been running into a lot of problems. There's a problem with the navigational units on these satellites, which, you know, is probably one of the most important parts of it. And it's way over budget and way behind schedule, too. And so the Senate wants quarterly updates on the progress, and they do not want um, NASA, or excuse me, not NASA, the Air Force, to spend any money, any more money purchasing more of these satellites from the manufacturer, Lockheed Martin until some of these problems are solved. And so it raises into question when the competition is going to start for launching these satellites, but regardless of when that competition takes place, they wouldn't be launched for several years anyway, even if the navigational problem was fixed right now. So uh, that is pretty cool, and it opens up a lot of new possibilities for SpaceX and a lot of different satellites in the future that they'll be able to launch from. They are going to have to redo this process for the Falcon Heavy, if they want to use the Falcon Heavy to launch national security payloads. As of right now, this certification is just for the Falcon 9 rocket. And I'm unsure whether or not there will be any more certification required for any of the different upgrades that SpaceX will do for their Falcon 9 because there is going to be a newer version that's going to be coming out soon. So um, I'm, I'm unsure about that, but that's worth looking into. Anyway, that's uh, your uh, space news for the week. All right, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, Space Mike and I are going to be debating the space launch system. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Look into her face, determination in her eyes. She won't give up a quit or fumble little fashion lies. Filled with awesome expectations. This girl's a fascination. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get into our fun little debate where Daddy and Daddy will be fighting, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific <laughs> this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed five dollars or more to this specific segment. If you'd like to figure out find out more information on how you can help crowdfund this show, uh, you can head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. We also have our space pods that uh, Space Mike is our admiral of. Uh, those are daily five-minute episodes about all things space-related. And uh, if you'd like to help contribute to those, that, uh, that campaign's over at uh, patreon.com slash space pod, singular. All right, let's go ahead and uh, bring, bring uh, there you go. <laughs> Um, all right, so uh, we were talking about uh, a few different topics, and uh, one of them that came up was the space launch system at this stage, whether it should be continued or whether it should be canceled. Uh, for those who don't know, the space launch system is NASA's uh, latest generation heavy lift, super heavy lift vehicle, ex excuse me, and it, uh, it is capable of sending, I believe the initial block one is a little over 70 metric tons up to low Earth orbit, which is quite a bit, quite a bit more than anything else that we have today. Uh, and it's pretty far along in the um, developmental stage, the paper rocket stage, although they are actually starting to build some, bend some metal and build some parts. So Space Mike will be taking the opinion that we should cancel the space launch system and continue with something else. And I will be taking the opinion that we should continue the space launch system because we are far enough along. So Space Mike, why don't you start us off? Why, why we NASA's got this thing. We've spent billions of dollars on it already. Why shouldn't we continue uh, with the space launch system? Well, it's funny that you bring up the billions of dollars that have been spent on it already, because that's my main reason for against it. Essentially, the space launch system is the Ares 5 rocket that was the whole plan after the shuttle for the Constellation program. And with the space launch system, I mean, it's, it's essentially extended version of the big orange tank that they used on the space shuttle, except on the bottom, they're going to be having four space shuttle main engines on, on that, the, re the reusable engines that they had. They only have about 
15 of those, but they are building, the company that makes them, Aerojet Rocketdyne, is building more of those. And uh, I could go in more and more details about the different hardwares, but my point is, is under the Constellation program, for the Ares 5 rocket and the Orion capsule was roughly about $6 billion invested into that program. Since it has evolved into the space launch system, there has been even, uh, as far as I know, it's roughly $3.5 billion more that have been invested into the program. And it's still nowhere near flight readiness. They have done lots of different tests and made lots of different progress in different areas, some of which have been canceled. For example, the J2X engine, which is going to be powering the upper stage of the Block 2 version of the space launch system, all work on that has been canceled, and it's unclear whether or not they're even going to continue with that engine. And a lot of money has been put into that engine already, and if that gets canceled, then you know there's even more money wasted. My whole argument is that there hasn't been enough oversight, not necessarily oversight, but more budget responsibility. There hasn't, it's, this is all under a cost plus architecture, and the, the manufacturers with cost plus contracting are incentivized to make delays, go over budget, and get the most out of it as possible. And some could argue that this entire space launch system is a jobs program anyway. And if that's the case, then, you know, for the sake of the American economy, I guess that's okay. But for the sake of getting into space quicker and getting a lot of NASA's goals accomplished, you know, to eventually get be able to put humans onto Mars, it's slowing things down a lot. And with all these billions of dollars that have been spent on the space launch system so far, there's only two official missions that are going to be on the books. And there hasn't been any sort of consensus as to what other payloads could be flown other than the Orion capsule. There have been lots of different proposals that have come out from different um, space launch engineers, the space launch system engineers, who have come out with some really interesting data that we could provide links for if, if uh, some of you guys in the chat room are interested, about what sort of payloads could be launched on the Block 1 and Block 2 versions of the space launch system. But none of these plans have been adopted yet, all because of the budget. And another thing about this rocket is this is all congressionally directed. NASA has been told exactly what requirements to follow, which manufacturers to go with to a point. They still they have a little bit of leverage with uh, mainly the solid rocket boosters. They want to have a competition for advanced boosters that could be either solid or liquid boosters. And so most of it, though, is under congressional direction. And the NASA administrator, Charles Bolden, has said in, in, in the past that, you know, most of the people in Congress are not rocket engineers, and they do not understand a lot of the different things that go into it. And just throwing more money at the problem under a cost-plus architecture, in my opinion, and that's all it is, is my opinion, is a waste of money. And I'm afraid that this program might not ever fly and just be canceled and all that money will be wasted anyway. So that's, that's kind of my argument. <laughs> all right, go ahead. So we have a couple of questions from the chat room, and they're, they are sort of directed at Mike to a certain extent. I don't know that you can necessarily answer these questions. You will answer these questions! Uh, and, uh, and of course, I'll do my best. If you, if you can, feel free. Uh, I, I believe Mini Elon's question was actually supposed to read, why doesn't NASA name the SLS the Saturn VI, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, so Old Bill asks... Actually, kind of, right? I mean, a, a throwback to the old Saturn V, it's going to have... Uh, although, is the SLS six engines? It's still five. It's four. Right? Yeah, there's it's four engines four, at the so bottom. Saturn four. Right. So, uh, old Bill asks, so do we just throw all the way, all throw all the money away and start over? Well, hang on. So, I think that goes to my point, which is we've already done that, and what we need to stop doing is giving NASA programs, and then every time we get a new president, canceling that program and trying something new. Space takes a long time to do this stuff, right? It, this is not an iPhone. You're you're not just building the simple little device that you can you can rev in a year and make it a, a better screen. Right. This is an a complex space transportation system that's pushing the boundaries of what some of these materials are capable of doing. So yeah, it's going to take the better part of a decade to get done and possibly more than one presidency to get this stuff done. Mm -hmm. So if we want to get these super heavy lift vehicles out there, we have to stop changing course <laughs> constantly and just say, look, NASA, here you go. You're building SLS. Mm -hmm. Th this is what your budget is. Now make it fly, in, you know, hopefully in this time frame. Now I do agree with some of what Mike said is uh, uh, with regards to missions. Mm -hmm. I really wish SLS 
to really make SLS make sense, we don't need to go, America needs a rocket. Let's see what we can stick on it. Right. What we need to do is go, America is going to do this in space. We're right. going to have this grand vision for space. Maybe it's sending humans to Mars. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the asteroid return mission, I, although I'm not a huge fan of the asteroid return mission, but okay, whatever. Uh, but it's something that... America as a whole can get behind and go, yes, I get this. Mm -hmm. And then we can go out and say, and we need this big heavy rocket to do it. So I really would like to see those missions come out and, and actually be put on the table of all these really cool things that SLS will enable. But the, the point is, without the heavy lift rocket, we'll never be able to do any of those really big, cool, heavy missions. Right. Right? We, we maybe we can't dream of those missions today. Maybe we just don't aren't sure whether the rocket's going to be done yet. Maybe we're not sure we want to apply anything to this to this rocket because it's not a real thing just yet. But what if you don't actually build the rocket? If it's never actually built, if no one ever builds a super heavy lift, a 70, 120 mm -hmm. metric tons rocket that can get big, big things into space, you're never going to enable the missions that allow big, big things into space. And we have a gap on either side, right? We can kind of do that medium slash light heavy stuff right now, mm -hmm. but we can't do, we, we don't do the small <coughs> stuff, the CubeSats, we don't do them very well. Mm -hmm. We got a couple companies taking care of that. We got the Electron rocket and the uh, other rocket I can't remember. What's the other rocket I can't remember? Right, no, I know, I know what you're talking about. Right, that's gonna be taken care of. Right. But who's working on this really super big ultra heavy stuff? Right. It's NASA. Great. And China, I guess. Right. <laughs> Are they? Is China? Has China announced anything with super heavy lift? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They've they've announced like their next like four rockets that they're planning on building. I believe that the heavy lift version is the Long March Five. Don't quote me on that. I'm not 100 percent, but I think it's the Long March Five that's going to be their heavy lift version. And according to the data that they're presenting, which course they haven't built it yet it's supposed to be comparable to the space launch system at least 100 metric tons which is in between block one and block two of the space launch system and what's their timeline for that their timeline for that as far as i know is going to be in the 2020s it, they are just now entering into their next five-year plan and the plans for they're going to start initial work for this next five-year block period but the real push for that to get that flying as far as i know is going to be in the next five-year program starting in 2020 which will likely be delayed. so it sounds like that's nothing more than a paper rock i mean pure paper rocket at this point <laughs> they haven't bent any metal and that's that's a difference between sls and something like that SLS is half paper half metal they actually have bent the metal for some of the parts right we have the engines a lot today. of hardware exists yeah yeah, yeah hardware actually hardware. exists a lot of it well yeah it depends on how you define a lot of it but like you don't have enough hardware to make the whole rocket today but it is actually starting to come together and become a cohesive big bad rocket that we could actually fly so mm -hmm. it, it's it's becoming very very real. At, at this point, I I don't think we're far enough along where I'm not sure it actually makes sense to cancel it. We have hardware, we have stuff that's that's ready to go. We should at least fly it once and go, yeah, look at what we are capable of doing. We need to use it as a way to inspire people again because without the space shuttle, NASA is having a hard time inspiring people. Now, that, I know. Well, right. I mean, the the inspiring thing about NASA is human spaceflight. Right. And planetary sciences are awesome, and they should be funded better. And uh, the Earth sciences are awesome, and they should be funded better. All these sciences, all the amazing things that NASA does, there is nothing wrong with them, and none of them should have their funds absorbed and taken by SLS, which is unfortunately what's happening today. Instead, we need to maintain their budgets or increase it slightly, and then also be able to fund SLS. But what's happening, uh, but what, I'm sorry, but what's really truly inspiring is the idea of planetary exploration by humans. Mm -hmm. Sending humans to the moon is a very inspiring thing. Sending, human, sending humans to Mars is a very inspiring thing. This rocket enables that. And um, this will enable NASA to inspire again. And who knows what will come out of that inspiration. So Chris Radcliffe in the chat room said, I've heard that every dollar spent on NASA returns 7 to $10 to the economy. Does that include programs like SLS? So um, that number has been refuted a little bit. Okay. Um, the real number seems to be more along three dollars. Okay. However, how awesome is that that we have a government program when you put spend a dollar in it, mm -hmm. it generates three. Right. Not a whole lot of government programs actually do that. 
which is an argument for NASA and for things like the SLS, because if we're spending a dollar on the SLS and getting three dollars back, mm -hmm. why aren't we spending more money to do this stuff? Right. And you ask, how, how can this happen? How do you put a dollar into NASA and get three dollars back? Mm -hmm. Well, it's all the stuff around it. It's all the science around it. It's all the people around it because you're not taking this money and shooting it up into space and then burning it in space. Right. You're spending that money down here. You're spending it on engineers. You're spending it on other companies that are developing things. You're spending it on science and research down here. And all of that generates additional money for our economy. U5KO actually also asked a really good question. Uh, says, this money will go to these districts for political reasons, give or take. How would you spend it better for the sake of getting to space? Uh, actually, that would probably go to, go to Mike, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you're saying kill the SLS, mm -hmm. Uh, the Space Launch System, sorry. Uh, what would you do with the money instead? With the money instead, honestly, it's not that I have anything against the Space Launch System from a technical standpoint. I think from a technical standpoint and all the progress that they've made so far is good. You know, if I suddenly had free reign with the budget, I would want to make sure that the rest of the program and up to, up to launching would not be done under a cost plus architecture, but under a fixed price contract. And it's sort of... It's sort of a mix between what the Saturn V development was like. Yes, it, it was kind of under a cost plus program, but they, I mean, they really were, were trying to be stingy with it and frugal with uh, the budget as much as they can. If you want to find more about budget shenanigans, there's lots of cool stuff that Warner Von Braun did, asking for twice the amount of money he needed so that he could build two of one of the rockets that were requested so that when they needed another one, he already had it ready to go. But that's not happening. There's a lot of this money that is, yes, creating jobs, yes, creating economy for, for the United States, and you know that's all well and good, but I think that it needs to be controlled more. I think that there should be you know, more than just annual re reviews. There should be quarterly reviews on all the progress. And if the manufacturers are falling behind on their projected goals, then they should have to move forward. And if not with, if we don't go with space launch system, Instead of, of putting money into that system, we should put more money into the smaller exploration missions and get a lot of stuff out there to lay the groundwork for future human missions. Because no human missions can happen without the robots that we send there first. The flybys, the orbiters, the landers, the rovers, all of that. And there's so many interesting places that we want to go to. You talked about earlier about how there's lots of uh, science missions that should be inspirational, but we're going with the rocket first. There's no shortage of ideas at NASA. There's lots of really cool, really great ideas, but as long as they're just ideas, you can't really push forward with it unless NASA and Congress decides to adopt these different plans. And I think that we should be doing a lot more of the, the way that NASA used to operate back in the 60s. Not necessarily on the same timetables, but you know, trying to accomplish these goals and doing it the, the best way that they possibly can and just have a lot more accountability for where this money is going. Why, why not the I same don't... timetables? Why not the same timetables? There needs to be a sense of urgency here. Otherwise, these projects will take 20, 30, 40, 50 years because they can, right? Why not go, look, you've got a 10-year marker. That's as long as you get. Technically, the space launch system has already been worked on for 10 <laughs> years. The program started in 2005, you know, plus or minus, you know, take away two or three years when it was being reviewed before it evolved into the space launch system. But, I mean, the program has already been going on for 10 years, and there's already been just about as much money put into it as there was for the Saturn V development. And that was not just for the development, but also for building all of the Saturn Vs that were used. But remember, and the, the space launch system is more powerful than the Saturn V, right? I mean, this, this is our generation's Saturn V. We, we've not had something like this on the face of the planet since the Saturn V. So this will re-enable, essentially, re-enable what the Saturn V can, could do. And people are like, well, you know, blah, 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 uh, Orion, something, something, HAB module. Oh, look, we can figure that all out. We still need the boost stage. We need that part of it to be big and powerful so we can do what they could do in the 60s. And that's what this is enabling. And you're, you're right. This has been going on for the better part of a decade, which I think is the wrong part. We should have... We should have had a timetable that was much more intense. We should have said, no, this, this cannot take a decade. This needs to go faster. But there were too much politics got involved. And, you know, we, we changed course 
what was it, three or four of the wet years into Constellation, yeah. which turned into a, a, a space launch system. And, you know, that, that created ha havoc and chaos. And you, we need to stop doing that. We need to go set some real timetables on these things. And we do need to go out and build these big, giant rockets. We need the small ones, too. And we need the ones in the middle as well. We also need the next generation propulsion system. We yeah. need all of it. Bah. I love how Mike is having this debate while wearing a NASA shirt, too, by the way. Well, he's not anti. <laughs> so, uh, you know, no, I'm not anti NASA. No, I'm not anti NASA. No, 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 no. I'm anti waste. Anti waste is <laughs> anti waste is fair, and I, you know, yeah. there are. I would say there are certainly issues with the S SL space launch system. <laughs> I'm struggling not to say SLS. I know. With the space launch system, <laughs> but you know, there are issues with every program, even from private companies. There are issues from that side. There will always be issues. Always, it's a, it's a give and tr take, right? right? That's what engineering is. It's it's trading something for something else and making decisions on what you want to do. And, you know, maybe they've made the right decisions, maybe they made the wrong decisions, but we are on the cusp of having our generation's Saturn V. And I think that's very cool. All right. So there. So there. So there. What do you, <laughs> Mike, any, uh, so that was my final soapbox comment. Mike, do, I'll give you a final soapbox. Did, did you have anything else you wanted to do? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I completely agree with what you said, that we do need a heavy lift rocket. We do need the capability to go out and send a lot of mass to do a lot of these really cool, interesting missions, some of which haven't been officially you know, adopted yet. But my final statement is I am very upset about the amount of waste and possibly even embezzlement that all this money is, is going into. I mean, just, just in the space part I talked about the other day where the United States Air Force is giving United Launch Alliance a billion dollars for ground support infrastructure, which is already built into the cost of every single Atlas V and Delta IV launch. You know, so I think there needs to be more accountability for a lot of a lot of that money. That was stuff that was brought up in the Augustine Commission, and the reason why the 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 excuse me the Constellation program was canceled in the first place because it was spending so much money, and it wasn't all accounted for. So that's my big issue is that NASA needs to stop wasting money. I'm okay if they want to continue with the space launch system. But I'm not okay if it costs the American taxpayer another $10 billion just to launch twice. So that is what I'm not okay with. I want the program to continue, but I want it to continue in a very responsible manner that actually pushes it forward instead of just trying to spread NASA money around to build the economy. So that's my final argument. I think that makes tons of sense. All right, I'd love to know what you, the community of tomorrow, think as well. Leave your comments here on YouTube, on our page over at tmro.tv, over at Patreon, wherever you want to leave a comment. We'll bring them into our next show that we do. Um, I think this is an interesting topic. What do you think? Not just should we cancel Constella uh, Constellation, uh, cancel SLS. Uh, we talked about that for so long. That's like the, the verbiage that comes out. <laughs> well, you know, basically, what do you think of SLS at this stage, right? Because if you've gone back a year or two years, my opinion of SLS is, is shifted throughout the years. Yeah. And that's allowed, right? I mean, we live in a society where people seem to think that you're never allowed to change your mind. As data changes, as things grow, you're allowed to change your mind. So um, what have you changed your mind to, if you've changed it at all? Do you think we should continue with the space launch system? Do you think it will fly? Uh, do you think it's a good idea? What are the pros, the cons? What do you think of the space launch system? Leave your comments. We're curious to know what you have to say. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, comments from our last show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get into comments from our last show, I wanted to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the Patreon Plus subscribers. These are the people who have contributed $2.50 
or more to this specific segment. Now, these are the people who will also get immediate access, I'm air quoting immediate, you can't see me do it, uh, to After Dark. As soon as we post it, it'll be available to them. For everyone else, you have to wait, I think it's like four weeks or so. It's kind of whenever I get around to actually posting it publicly, which sometimes is four weeks and sometimes maybe it's six or eight weeks. So, but the Patreon Plus subscribers get it right away, but there are more. If you can't do $2.50 per episode, which comes out to about uh, $10 a month or so, or probably closer to $7.50 a month, uh, there is the Patreon campaign, or Patreon level as well. These are people who've contributed one US penny or w up to $2.49 per episode. That means you can contribute as little as four cents per month and you can get your name in the show itself as yeah. someone who's helping to contribute. We wanted to make this as inclusive as possible for anyone who might want to be able to see it. You, if you'd like to help contribute to the show and crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, we're going to do... <laughs> I wanted to see if I could slip up our director. I, I was unable to do so. <laughs> well played, Dada. Well played. All right, let's uh, let's hit up some comments from our, our last show. First up is is this hi? Hi, Mike. <laughs> I got him. I got him. <laughs> First up is <laughs> there. We go. That was impressive. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> oh, ready go. Oh goodness, this one comes from YouTube by uh, Nilly Philly. It says, is it possible to get a commercial space hotel lab with the Bigelow modules and resupply cargo and crew before 2020? I would like to see that. So Hashtag we were moon. able to put humans on the moon in under 10 years. So yeah, the answer is yes, it is possible, right? Is uh, it going to happen? I don't know. Uh, you know, there has to be a will to do it. Really, that's yeah. what it comes down to is, is if you find a will, if the, you have the will, you will find a way to make it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but there needs to be not just like one person's will. It needs to be a collective will of people who want to make this happen. And um, I don't know if we have, so the Bigelow modules, uh, I oh, believe- Oh, Nilly Pilly, sorry, not Nilly Philly. It, I well, apologize. Bigelow modules feel like that's actually probably the easy part. I don't know, actually before 2020, right? Cause you just, you launch the Bigelow modules up. It's already on, mid 2015, uh, man. I know, but the, the crew, right? Like, Four and a you've half got, years? You've got Boeing who'll be flying in 2017. Right? You've got SpaceX who should be flying crew in 2017 that can go to low earth orbit you just need to get the bigelow module up there um i but, and think the bigelow cargo and crew so it would be multiple launch you wouldn't be all one thing yeah, right yeah, yeah. you'd have to launch the bigelow modules up on like a falcon heavy or an sls right, right. and then you actually you could probably do it with one of their really large modules and just you know create one big space station and then you resupply it with the commercial crew in theory, uh, yeah. the timeline works, really, right? I think the timeline actually works. Yeah. Assuming the Bigelow module fits on a Falcon Heavy. Right. I don't remember that part. I think it does. If it does, then yeah, you, we're probably I think okay. So. If it only goes on an SLS, then we're probably going to miss that timeline, realistically. Okay. So that's kind of an interesting idea. Does Falcon Heavy and commercial crew enable privatized space hotels that or slash research stations? That would be awesome. That's an interesting, there's another interesting. Do we have a Bigelow slash Virgin hotel in space supplied by SpaceX? That would actually be kind of, be kind of cool. Although I think, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. All right. With batteries by Tesla? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right. Just thinking out loud. Moving along. Hmm. Moving along. This one comes from Daniel Knight, also known as Mini Elon. Yes, the commenter is the best commenter for any launch event. Arian Space, hashtag rubble in the Amazon jungle, hashtag TMRO. <laughs> I absolutely love the Arian Space uh, announcers. Yeah. They, they are so excited over the launch. They, they bring a element of awesome yeah. to launches that I think is uh, not present on other launch coverage. Like NASA is... Um, what's what's the opposite of that? They're the opposite of that, right? Sure, but even Chris They're Radcliffe... stoic. The Chris Radcliffe brought up in the chat room earlier about the uh, the French uh, commentary is also the sort of like slightly don't care. It sounds really great. Un, deux, trois. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. that's counting up, but sure. Well, yeah, they count down and then they count up. Oh, yep, all right. Well, yeah, I guess they do. Uh, but yeah, with a slight element of like non-care. Yeah, right, blah, blah. And then, and then as soon as that's done... Right, that's done. And then you get the English comment here, King again. Oh my goodness, the rumble in the Amazon jungle as it flies overhead. In one breath, 
five minutes long of yeah. yelling. It yeah. is, it's a lot of fun. I think they make it actually, I actually watch for that because yeah. I'm like, <laughs> what? He has like, he has, you know how um, NASA has a launch line? Yeah. Like, hoisting harmony to the heavens and beyond. Yes. But that's, that's it, right? They, they right. do one lift off, lift off a space shuttle Atlantis, hoisting harmony to the heavens and beyond. And then they do it in this really, It's yeah. funny though, because Ziggur in the chat room says it's just not a launch without the soothing tones of PAO George Diller. Well, yeah. Public affairs officer. But, you know, but does it have to be just because that's what it's been? I have no problems with George Diller. He's, yeah, no, no, He's no. a good guy, and he he, has, he does, he's got a very soothing this. But there's something fun about it kind of almost being like a really exciting NASCAR event. Right. right. Like, I mean, I, I realize the car's doing nothing but turning left, but somehow they make it exciting. I actually don't care about NASCAR. But whatever, he still makes the launch, the launch itself exciting by, right. you know, and you hear the rock and back. Chris Radcliffe says this is very French, like she's dragging a cigarette between statements. <laughs> Agreed. Right, moving totally on, agreed. Moving on, moving uh, on. All right. Uh, last comment comes from Lars Neeson. Nielsen. Uh, tomorrow, are the space bots not putting, being put on iTunes anymore? Um, that's me. So uh, the problem is I have been scary busy at the day job. I have been traveling the country, and I really have not had time or access for the space bots. And Space Mike has been taking care of them completely. However... There are a one butt unit of steps in order to get it into it's one unit of butt uh, steps uh, to get it. I don't know. That's a new one. <laughs> to get it into iTunes, uh, they're also missing on Roku, and they're also missing on most most of our social media channels. Really, if you want the space pods, you have to go to our YouTube channel today. Um, when I get more time and I can start throwing time at the problem again, I'll start I'll start working on that and. I think we'll see an increase in space pod viewership because right now you you just don't even know they're out unless you're subscribed to our YouTube channel. So I will work that, but realistically, not until after August, unfortunately. That's, I think, when everything's going to... I don't want to use the words calm down because that's those aren't the right words, but we'll become tolerable again, I think. Well, you're coming up to pace with your life. What, I'm coming up to pace well, with it's, my... It's, it's kind of... I feel like it's sort of like running a marathon. Sure. You can't just say, I'm going to run a marathon and then go run out go out and run a marathon, right? Sure. You have to you have to practice for it. Sure. You have to, like, continually... You have to sort of get your time down. You have to get your body in shape. You, you know, that to, actually is a little bit what, like, working at the day job is like, is running a continuous marathon. A continuous marathon. <laughs> and there's there's really not a whole lot of good training for it, by no, the way. there isn't. Because uh, <laughs> they're like, hey, hey, you want to run, run a 5K? You're like, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, like, great. Run this marathon, and when you're done with that, run another one. Right. Uh, yeah, a friend of ours uh, recently left the day job, and he said, well, you know, hopefully I'll be able to, to you know, hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll do good, you know, because I was wishing mm. him luck and what have you, and I said, oh, no worries, you have day job training. <laughs> like, you'll, you'll do fine. Eight hours a day? <laughs> That'll feel like nothing. No. It'll be great. All right, that's our show for this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Uh, After Dark is up next if you're watching live for your Patreon Plus subscribers. That should be available on Patreon uh, sometime very soon. For everyone else, it should be available in about... So uh, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week. Oh! What was that? Oh, Dada. We're going to leave that in there because that was, that was impressive. But Dada. Dada. That's what happens when we're not on the air for two weeks.